welcome. Today we are here to discuss the Wave Judge 5000, which is part of Keysight and San Jose's wireless analyzer technology. The Wave Judge 5000 uh, wireless analyzer, as depicted in the picture below, is certainly a modularized hardware that has future proof technology due to its software programmability. We'll talk a little bit about the expandability of the system as well as its modularity as we move through the presentation. Let's talk a little bit about some of the key challenges when we talk about testing mobile communications and specifically modem chipsets. Many times it's difficult to determine what protocol messages were actually sent, especially when we start to take a look at its relevance to the phi events that may have occurred underlying the actual protocol itself. In many cases, diagnosing the root causes of the problems between the layers may take many hours, days, or even weeks. The solution here is the Wave Judge 5000's capability. If we look at the bottom right-hand corner of the diagram here, it was designed with the layers in mind. What do we mean by that? In particular, we have a physical layer here in the chipset with protocol layers built on top of that. Historically speaking, analyzers focused very heavily either at the physical layer or at the upper layers. The WaveJudge 5000 was designed to really encompass the best of both worlds, have deep physical layer analysis capabilities tied and correlated very closely with the upper layers in the protocol stack. In addition to that, in many cases, the UE logs may be monitoring what moves through the upper layers into the PHY itself. At the same time, the GNOID-B may also have its own set of logs doing the inverse in terms of the downlink versus the uplink reception. The uniqueness of the WaveJudge 5000 is it actually sits in between the UE and the GNOID-B independently and passively collecting both the downlink and the uplink and then giving a complete correlated view of all those layers. So as mentioned here, the WaveJudge 5000 has the ability to record and review conditions. It's passive without interfering in any of the communications between the GNODE-B and the chipset itself. And it provides an insightful wireless analysis tool set with a highly correlated GUI that we'll be going through later in the presentation. Talk a little bit about what the 5000 allows you to do. We've talked about protocol exchange errors that sometimes are not found in the end equipment logs. The ability to actually check these logs independently provides insight into solving problems. Understand how the PHY affecting the upper layer performance is also extremely important. So the correlation between the PHY and the upper layers is something that is focused on with the WaveJudge 5000's analysis capabilities. Quite often these issues are quite complex because they're spanning multiple layers. The bottom line is we're trying to avoid delays in the R&D early on in the cycle and then moving through the various stages of your product's evolution and system integration, system test, conformance labs, when it matures into the interoperability labs and even in the deployment stages where the lab tests may not necessarily mirror what's happening in the field. The Wave Judge 5000 actually allows you to stop finger pointing between the UE vendors, the operators, and the GNOD-B vendors, and really apply your engineering resources to solve the real issues. In the end, we're providing the ultimate authority in wireless testing. Let's go over some sample case studies where the Wave Judge was used to quickly identify issues. In this particular case, the UE and the GNODE-B were in an interoperability type test. The situation was that an optimized software had been implemented in a new algorithm on the GNODE-B in order to achieve higher downlink throughput. Unfortunately, the UE detected 80% downlink PDSCH blur compared with the original legacy algorithm. What was the pain point? The pain point was the GNODE-B algorithm was working on a different UE chipset, did not find any significant issues. But from the UE side, 
much labor had to be included for trying to figure out why there was a high blur. And this typically is a very complex problem because you're troubleshooting into the code of the UE itself. The solution, however, was quite easy. And the 5000 actually analyzed the IQ data and found a bug related to how the UE was calculating PDSCH resource block offsets. Simply by seeing a PDSCH, verifying its analysis results being correct and looking at the offset itself solved the problem quickly and got the UE vendor back on track. Let's look at another case study. This is quite common when the testing results differ between equipment. So you've got the UE, you've got the G node B, and you've got a different set of results. In this case, the UE module vendor participated in an operator's performance verification testing. The blur was shown at 100% when measuring the uplink MAC throughput using a 256 QAM and MCS modulation value of 27. What was the pain point? Several test instruments were used and measured the TX EVM for the pushes, also at 256 QAM MCS 27. Key sites UXM, as an example, showed the EVM submarginal at 3 to 4 percent. Another test instrument showed slightly higher EVM at 1.2 percent with no blur. This obviously caused some confusion. The UE module vendor really had no idea who to rely on and how to call a meeting between the four parties. Sound familiar? Time wasted? Wave judge brought in. What was found was the IQ data for the constellation diagram coupled with the actual CCDF measurement showed in the bottom right hand corner on port two, a PAPR problem where the actual CCDF diagram showed saturation and a quick drop off of the expected data. This caused a phase rotation in the constellation and showed errors caused by that phase rotation. At the end of the day, the wave judge again very quickly verified the problem and got the engineers working in the right area. Here's another diagram that talks a little bit about registration sequences, which are quite popular with the wave judge analysis tool. In many cases, you're looking at a successful network entry and the ability to look at both the downlink and the uplink information simultaneously becomes extremely important. In this case, you can actually see downlink in the non-shaded color and uplink in the shaded color. So being able to run through complete network entry solutions and sequences along with physical layer information becomes quite a powerful tool as well and often used in the UE chipset domain. Talk a little bit about the hardware itself. As you can see, the hardware takes many shapes. Certainly the most simple basic solution would be a single chassis, one UI high with the software running on a Windows PC. That system can grow depending upon the test requirement of the end user. In this case, you see four chassis daisy chained together using what we call SRIO. So now we have a complete modular system all routed together on a backplane of an SRIO network. Each of the assets or modules as they're called can vary depending upon the test requirements themselves. The system itself has centralized clocking and it's completely scalable. Talk a little bit more about the actual modules that can go into the system. They range both in the actual FR1, FR2 type channel bandwidth. So in this case, you see an RX judge, which is a receiver port that handles FR1 high band, 800 megahertz channel bandwidth. We also have FR1 low bandwidth, 40 megahertz receiver modules. This in point actually has four ports where you have single port 800 megahertz modules as well. This module coupled with the millimeter wave converter provides FR2 capabilities with this remote radio head converter. Other modules might include clocking modules such as the synthesizer judge. 
We also have high intelligence added to the system with our IntelliJudge modules, which is a bank of DSPs. And then lastly, you have high storage capability requirements in some test cases where you actually can implement an SSD stick off the shelf at one terabyte for IQ storage. As you can see, there are a host of modules that allow you really to tailor your system to the test requirements you might have. Our GUI, as we talked about early, focuses in not only on the network entry, but on all the layers. So taking a look at any layers, layer one through layers three, is very easy, very quick, and also highly correlated with deep physical layer analysis. You can see constellation, time domain power, CCDF graphs, and even scheduling information mixed in with the message list. We'll talk a little bit further of this when we get to the GUI portion of this demonstration. Often people ask us, well, how do I actually hook this up? Can I use antennas? Can I use splitters? Can it be in a conductive environment? The answer is yes to all of those questions. This is an, a sample of how you might incorporate the wave judge into an existing scenario where you have eSight's UXM along with the CIU that allows for emulation of the G node B. Remote radio heads actually step it up to FR2, and you might have a chipset in the cater itself, shown as the device under test. In this scenario, easy conductive splitters allow the downlink to be dropped to the hardware, the Sandrile Wave Judge 5000 hardware, and also at the same time, you can drop the uplink, so you're looking at both the downlink and the uplink bidirectionally. That information is caught with the hardware passively, and the IQ samples are then sent to the PC for analysis in our GUI. Here's another scenario where you still have the UXM, the device under test in the cater. In this case, early on, you might not necessarily need or have the budget for the hardware. We can actually allow the UXM to collect IQ samples and send those IQ samples directly to the test PC, as well as using the WaveJudge software for further analysis. So two basic ways of actually implementing the WaveJudge 5000 into an existing UXM remote radio head cater type of scenario. Let's take a pause now here and move to the GUI so we have a better idea of once the IQ samples are collected, what would some of the analysis look like from a software standpoint? In this case, let's go to the configure test, and get us an idea of what actually we were handling during this application. So in this application, we actually had two cells. It was an NSA capture, meaning non-standalone, where the UE actually joined the first cell, a 4G LTE cell, of both two downlink and one uplink antennas. And then after joining that primary cell, it sent the reconfiguration message to set up a secondary cell, which contained 5G. This is often commonly referred to as dynamic spectrum sharing or DSS type application. In this case, we use the combination of 4G as well as 5G technology with a common set of Wave Judge 5000 hardware. We use the real-time analysis piece on the LTE to capture the messages and to trigger a capture of IQ samples for non-real-time processing of the 5G cell itself. What we see here is messages on the left-hand side in our message list. Again, non-shaded color means downlink direction. The shaded color means uplink direction. In this case, because it was a commercialized network, you can actually see a number of RNTIs or UEs that were on the commercial network. In addition to that, we set up a number of KPIs along the top of the screen, errors, modulation type, RSRQ, EVM. Really, you have the ability to take a look at any of the KPIs that we've actually collected over the past history 
10, 15 years, various technologies shown and customer requests. Build the message list quite handily. You can also select what layer you'd like, either using the basic detail level or radio buttons, taking you further up the stack, or individually you can choose any of the layers themselves or messages themselves. Along with the message list, we also have corresponding charts. You can choose these charts to monitor the health of the channel itself, such as the CFITCH. We can also look at throughput in the downlink and the uplink, EVM in the downlink and the uplink, and various other parameters, including CRC or blur. In this, in this case, you can see because we had a number of UEs, we really were interested in the single UE that we carried out into the field. So we set up a filter to filter out the specific UE that we were interested in. So here you can actually, the filter is applied. You can see now all of the same UNT, or the RNTI, which represents a single UE. The protocol analyzer portion of the WaveJudge 5000 allows you to double click on any message. We'll give you now the actual hex as well as decimal representation of the message itself as you click through it and even nested messages within. Now this is showing you then the protocol analysis view of the system. Similarly, we could also take this a step further and dive into the physical layer in a very deep analysis mode. Let's go ahead and change screens and look at that a little further. In this case, again, same configuration where we had both the LTE and the 5GNR DSS cells working together, but we're going to analyze a little bit further the 5G piece, and we're going to do that with our physical layer screen shown on the right-hand side. For those of you familiar with VSAs and spectrum analyzers, these screens may look somewhat similar. You can see constellation diagrams, time domain power diagrams, beam forming diagrams, spectral power diagrams, quite a few charting capabilities all shown with the right click of a button and you can choose both time and frequency domain type analysis views. In this case, you can see that the chart properties we chose to look at more of the physical layer, and we did that through just selecting chart properties and moving into the basic level details of transport blocks, reference signals, as well as MACRRs. You can see as you click along the top here, again, we have the ability to decode the messages. So in this case, here's my mid message decoded. But we can go a little bit further and start taking a look at items like reference signals. In this case, the reference signal shows which ports physically were used as well as logically within a G node V and the associated EVM and power in each of those receiver antennas through the ports. Also notice here, I can click on PDSCH. It would bring me to that exact PDSCH in my list here and show the various parameters of the PDSCH or any transport block. Similarly, as you point and click to any interval or message or transport block within the message list, notice that you have interactive correlated diagrams here. For example, if I was to choose the PDSCH in the list, notice in my time domain power, we actually draw exactly where that message began, where that transport block began and where it ended, showing you both instantaneous power and average power. In this particular case, we were troubleshooting the PUSCH and seeing errors in the first instance of the G node B actually sending opportunities or scheduling opportunities for the UE to actually transmit. The modem vendor was not sure whether or not it was actually sending the message or the scheduling from the G node B was actually correct. So in this case, we can actually click on the PUSCH 
And because the PUSCH is tied to the uplink RX receiver number seven within cell two, we change the view to actually look at that particular port. By doing that and selecting the first push, we can now bring up our 2D power diagram and we can actually see that there is a push scheduled within the diagram itself. So let's go ahead, look at the frame 728. You can see the wave judge actually drew a green and red arrow tick mark showing you information within this slot. That information is color coded and actually has chart properties to give you the key. Click into the chart itself. We see that the push is actually a light blue cayenne color. So we can actually see that here in that slot. That verifies to us from the modem's perspective that the G node B actually did schedule a PUSCH to be sent. So that's one half of the analysis. The other now would be, did the push get actually sent by the UE? We can do that by now overlaying the power that we've received in the uplink direction by clicking on sub, uh, subcarrier power. And what we see here is a combination of colors with no distinct color coding or power intensified where the PUSCH should have been. So this tells us that the push was actually not sent by the UE while it was actually scheduled by the G node B. Conversely, if we were to look at one of the successfuls, we can see that when the push was sent on 18078 RNTI, we saw an error. The first entry where we don't see an error is when the push is actually on 18077. We can take a look at that and we'll also see how now the UE vendor can verify that I actually have power on this push. And this is why the push actually was successful. You can see here, much brighter power that's scheduled where the push actually was scheduled by the G node B. So again, another way to take a look at how the correlation between lower layers and upper layers occur, and you have a fully correlated system on the right-hand side of the GUI to allow you to quickly troubleshoot. We're gonna wrap up the session now. I'd like to welcome you to provide any type of questions to us about both hardware and software. Very easy by emailing us at sanjalay at keysight.com. We are well positioned to handle the future and look forward to working with you. Thank you.